I invite the second speaker for today, Dr. Abraham, who is the professor and head of obstetrics and gynecology and head of the gynecology oncology unit at CMC Vellore. He's completed his undergraduate and postgraduate studies at CMC Vellore and is a faculty there. He's done his MRCOG in the UK and later on his fellowship in gynecology oncology in the US. He's interested in HPV and cervical neoplasia. Good morning, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Soam, for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be part of this fantastic uh, conference. So my mandate is to talk about the extent and role of lymphadenectomy in endometrial cancer. So stage one is seen in about 75% or more of cases, hence there's a very good chance of cure. However, like it was pointed out in the morning, in apparent stage one or early disease, at least 10% have extra uterine disease. And the staging is surgical in order to define the extent of spread and also to tailor the treatment and also to offer prognosis. Now there are different approaches to the lymph nodes and we know that there's a lot of controversy here. Lymph node may be omitted as it was done in many European countries where they believe that you can you know, handle the nodes by giving radiation. Or it could, it could be universal, like in many American centers where they remove all the nodes for all the patients. And there are different advantages and disadvantages for these various approaches. But as was championed in the Mayo Clinic, and I think now more people are going towards the selective approach, where you try and categorize these patients for various risk levels and then decide on the extent of lymph nodes, whether to omit, whether to do pelvic nodes only, or whether to do paraortic as well. All this depends on your perception of risk and your understanding of risk as to how much the, the risk of the nodes being involved are. And also it depends on your threshold for action. I mean, we have various thresholds, patients may have various thresholds, but these are not clear and cut answers. I mean, how often do we ask the patient, are you willing to accept a 1%, 5%, or 10% risk of lymph nodes? How often do we ask ourselves, are we prepared to do a complete lymphadenectomy for a 1% risk or a 3% risk? So all of this is a, is a philosophical approach to the problem. So to do lymph nodes or not to do, does it decrease recurrence? Does it improve survival? Does it cause harm? And can you do it? if it is in the patient's be best interest? Are we trained to do it? And then, of course, how lymph lymphadenectomy should be done, whether it should be open, laparoscopic, or robotic. Now, this is just a graph to show the number of deaths in the US due to cancer, and also the amount of deaths due to terrorist threats. On the left-hand side, the blue, and on the right-hand side, how much money the U.S. spends on the National Cancer Institute and also on the war in Iraq. So just to show that sometimes our decisions are totally irrational, not based on you know, a rational understanding of the problem, but on emotional grounds. Similarly, our approach to cancer. So we know that the approach is surgical, Staging, so general anesthesia, midline incision, exploration of the entire abdomen, pelvis with washings, extrafacial hysterectomy, biopsies of suspicious areas, pelvic and parotic lymphadenectomy, omentectomy, and type 2 tumors. And the surgical staging has changed, and now for stage 3, we have C1 for positive pelvic nodes and C2 for positive parotic nodes. So if you want to properly stage the patient, then we do have to do a lymph node dissection. We need to understand something about the lymphatic drainage. So there are four drainage channels from the uterus, from the fundus, as was being discussed earlier in the morning, and these follow the gonadal vessels to the paraortic area, in the folds of the broad ligament, along the mesosalpings and fallopian tubes, and along the round ligaments. So we do see you know, inguinal nodes as well. But most of the nodes are the pelvic and then going on to the paraortic. Now, we have looked at the various factors and the risk of node 
metastasis, both pelvic and paraortic. So this slide shows you that if you look at the histology, endometrioid versus non-endometrioid, what is the risk in pelvic uh, nodes, what is the risk in paraortic nodes. Similarly, if you take grade, grade 1, 2, and 3, less the differentiation, more risk of metastasis. Similarly, myometrial invasion, and, and also the location, whether it's in the body of the uterus, the isthmus, and of course the fundus. And then if you look at LBSI or extra uterine disease. Now this is like a univariate analysis where you're taking each individual factor separately, but life is more complex. It's all the interplay of all these various factors. So sometimes it's very difficult to say what exactly is the risk. Because if you might have endometrioid grade three, no myometrial invasion or deep myometrial invasion and so on. Or you might have uh, a non-endometrioid clear cell just in a polyp with absolutely no invasion. So very difficult sometimes to assess the risks when there is an interplay of all these factors. And this is the data from the Mayo Clinic done sometime a few years ago where they showed that about a third of their patients are low risk, that is endometrioid histology, grade one and two with less than 50% invasion and less than two centimeter size of lesion. But in two thirds of the time, they have and non-endometrioid, endometrioid, endometri but grade three or m deep myometrial invasion or a large size tumor. And this is just their analysis of their uh, series. It's prospectively done, but anal analyzed uh, from medical records. And they find that if it is less than 50% grade one, it's on about 3.5% risk. Whereas in grade two, grade three, and more than 50% invasion, the risk is much higher. Similarly, the risk of paraortic lymph nodes being involved in endometrioid cancer. Again, if you take these two-thirds of high-risk patients, if it is grade one, less than 50%, probably the risk of paraortic nodes is quite low. So this is what I was trying to say. We need to have some understanding as to what is the risk and then our threshold for action. Generally, we do not do lymph node dissection if it's a less than 5% risk. But this is debatable. So how do we plan surgery? If it is low risk, we just do TH, BSO, washings, decide in the OR about further staging procedures. I always cut the specimen in the OR, although we try to look at the size of the tumor, which we could probably do quite well. But myometrial innovation, again, is quite often difficult to do. I mean, we could have a magnifying glass in the OR, but some you might want to just send the specimen to the pathologist if you have good frozen section. And in the Mayo Clinic, you have the pathologist just in the adjacent room to your OR. So it's very easy. You can, or somebody from your team can walk over to the pathologist and look at the specimen with the pathologist. If it is high risk, then you, of course you do TH, BSO, washings, pelvic and paraortic lymph nodes. And if it's grade three, non-endometrioid histology, and so on, the risk is definitely quite high. So selective nodal dissection, this is what we do, but nothing really original. I've just adapted what was uh, championed at the Mayo Clinic. So if it's less than 5% risk, probably less than 3%, where it's endometrioid, less than two centimeters, grade one, no myometrial invasion, I don't do lymph nodes. So many of the cases of complex atypical hyperplasia, and when there is cancer, it really falls into this category. So sending for frozen or not, and that could be debated. Pelvic nodes, when the risk is five to 10%, endometrioid, more than two centimeters, grade two lesions, less than 50% invasion, or going on to the isthmus. And I do pelvic and paraortic lymph nodes when it's non-endometrioid, all grade threes, more than 50% invasion, or if there's extra uterine disease. The problem is, how do you assess these things? Sometimes, I mean, we can get some information from our preoperative curatage. We can get some information from imaging. So some centers would do MRI on everybody, but I don't. I do MRI only if I'm in a very selected group, especially when I'm in young patients where you're not planning surgery. But now in Institute, now we are doing ultrasound for everybody, but even that is debatable. Since we are really going to go in and do a systematic lymphadenectomy, there's how much more do you gain by doing 
imaging. So that can be discussed. So these are the various nodes and that you would need to address, the obturators, the internal iliacs, the external iliacs, the common iliacs, the entire to cable, the para cable, and as was well demonstrated by Dr. Somashekar this earlier on. We need to understand the pelvic anatomy, the operator space, the drainage of the gonadal vessels on the right side. It goes, the right gonadal vein goes from the IVC and on the left side to the left renal vein. So you really need to dissect out the vessels. Here it's showing the right operator nerve and the external iliac artery. Again, the paraortic area. These pictures you would see much better live in our uh, surgeries this morning and also some of the video sessions. So I'll just go on. So the extent of pelvic lymph nodes, in about 30% of high-risk patients have positive pelvic lymph nodes. So a comprehensive lymphadenectomy needs to be done, not cherry-picking, not sampling. It's been shown that the more nodes you remove, the more chance of you picking up disease. The external iliac nodes you need to remove above the level of the deep circumflex iliac vein. If you go beyond that, then the chance of... See, the, in, in surgery, you can remove as much as you want, but the problem is the more you do, the more complications you run into. So if you start removing uh, nodes below the deep circumflex iliac vein, then the more edema that you have to handle post-op. You would remove the lower common iliac nodes, the internal iliac nodes, the operator nodes above the operator nerve. If you go below the operator nerve, then you get into the operator vessels. The extent of paraortic lymph node dissection, overall only about 2% have positive paraortic lymph nodes above the level of the IMA. But in high-risk patients, about 16% have isolated paraortic lymph node involvement. And in patients who have positive paraortic lymph nodes, 75% are above the level of the IMA. So that's what Dr. Somashekar was saying, that you need to go above the level of the IMA to the renal veins and the node at the junction of the left renal vein and the aorta is very important. Similarly, the right para cable nodes. And how many nodes do you remove? I mean, we try and remove as much as you can in these the areas that you have defined. And normally you get 8 to 10 at each site. I mean, of course, sometimes it all depends on whether your pathologist can count or not. Apologies to Dr. Sunanti. But sometimes whether they, how hard they look and how they separate out. But so it varies from place to place. Now, just to go at some of the trials that have caused us to think about these things and debate, and probably even in the US, many centers have stepped back from universal lymphadenectomy to selective lymphadenectomy after this trial came out. So the Aztec trial presumed stage one endometrial cancer where patients were randomized to TH-BSO removal of enlarged nodes only, and the other group had TH-BSO and a systematic pelvic lymphadenectomy. Paraortic lymphadenectomy was not done in this trial. 1A, G3, 1B, G1 to 3, clear cell and UPSC patients were randomized. Again, a second randomization to observation plus or minus brachytherapy versus external brachytherapy plus or minus, external beam radiation therapy plus or minus brachy. And overall survival and disease-free survival were assessed. So the Aztec lymphadenectomy trial was a large trial on 1,408 patients with apparent stage 1 uterine cancer. THBSO pelvic washings, excision of enlarged nodes versus a systematic lymphadenectomy. Paraortic lymphadenectomy was rarely done. It was not part of the protocol. So there was no difference in overall survival, no difference in disease-specific survival adjusted for covariates, and no difference in recurrence-free survival. The pitfalls of the Aztec, although this, you know, randomized control trials are at the top of our uh, pyramid of hi the hierarchy of research designs, most of the people have not accepted the Aztec trial because only a third of patients were at high risk. So it was not powered enough to show the difference in the management in high risk patients. CT, MRI evidence of enlarged nodes did not exclude women. So even though on imaging they had large nodes, 
they went into the trial and standard treatment group had suspicious nodes removed. The pelvic node counts were low. In some places, it was less than three or four nodes. The lymphadenectomy group did not have parotid lymph node dissection. A second randomization to external beam radiation resulted in some node positive patients not being adequately treated. So these are the various problems. And so what really happened was, you know, you really narrowed down the differences between the two groups and understandably you don't show any difference. Now the CEPAL study in Japan was a study to evaluate the parotid lymph node dissections. It's a retrospective study, but here, 325 patients with pelvic lymph nodes versus 346 patients with parotid lymph nodes, also done. And the overall survival were more, was more in those who had pelvic and parotid lymphadenectomy. This was true in inter intermediate and high-risk patients, but not in the low-risk patients. And this was true in those who required adjuvant RT or chemotherapy. So there have been other retrospective studies that show, have shown that patients do benefit from parotid lymphadenectomy. Now complications of lymphadenectomy, you could have injury to large vessels, sepsis, and these are rare if you are well trained and uh, you know, after your initial learning curve. But paralytic ileus could be there in 10 to Dr. 30 percent. Uh, I would request you to be please quicker. All right, okay. Now sentinel lymph node dissection is another approach where you try and uh, address the lymph nodes without uh, that in the resultant complications. So this is a different risk categorization of the patients. And just to show that the risk of lymph node involvement and the five-year survival. So if there is cervical involvement or if there's um, in any grade, the five-year survival drops down to 50%. There have been various other approaches, vaginal hysterectomy and then decide laparoscopic and robotic hysterectomy and so on. So we are tending to move away from open surgery to minimally invasive approaches. So in conclusion, molecular understanding has improved, staging of endometrial cancer has changed, surgical staging has to be done by a gynae oncologist, surgeons who are trained in addressing pelvic and parotid lymph nodes. The various approaches to lymph nodes have been discussed, but I would go with selective lymphadenectomy after categorizing the risk and trying to move towards minimally invasive surgery. Robotic surgery is really great, but the costs are keeping several of us uh, out of that. So the take home message would be that systematic lymphadenectomy and not sampling and lymphadenectomy in selected patients who are at significant risk of nodal meds and tailored adjuvant therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr.